Oh, hang on. Hello and well. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Gallery. It's going to be the beginning of the, the episode now, isn't it? This is, <laughs> yes, this is the cold open. Oh, hang Hello on. and. <laughs> and now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Welcome to And Now for Something Completely Machinima, the podcast about machinima, virtual production, whatever you want to call it. We don't care. This episode, we are going to, uh, well, first I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce us. How about that? Let's, let's actually pretend this is a professional show or something. My name is Phil Rice. I'm here with Tracy Harwood Hello. and Damian Valentine. Hello. And debuting on the show today, Generative AI, Ricky Grove. Ricky, say hello to everybody. Ricky? There's something. Uh... Hmm. What was that? Well, he'll, he'll, maybe, maybe That's it needs different. more, it may need more input to, uh, to get a proper response so we'll just uh but anyway ricky is uh away um everything is is good um but with his cooperation we are implementing this this generative ai version of ricky uh we're all very excited about that technology very optimistic about it and uh this is a great way to to kind of show off probably the future of podcasting it, it's going to enable us all to take vacations when we want to um it's exciting times so uh, we will be consulting. We'll we'll throw it over to Ricky here and there, uh, AI Ricky, excuse me, and uh, see what he has to contribute. So this episode is all about the news, what's been going on. So Tracy, why don't you uh, lead us through this? Oh my God, yeah, I've got quite a bit to tell you about. Um, but let's start with um, something that I thought um, I haven't really found too much out about this, but. It's something we need to talk about. So uh, let's let's sort of reflect for a moment on the launch of the NVIDIA Machinima app, which was, when was that launched? Not that long ago, a couple of years ago. Three. Okay. Well, we've not heard very much about it <laughs> for quite some time. Uh, and frankly, I can't find very much about how it is being treated, I think, as a legacy app, because it does appear that it has disappeared um, and has been probably subsumed into Composer. Um, now, the only thing that kind of alerted me to this was that I caught sight of a short that apparently celebrates its demise, which is by a little video by Pekka Varis, and that video is called Restaurant RTX 4K Camilla Tomb. And I'll share the link on our show notes for that. But maybe you guys have seen something about this because I, I really can't find very much out about what's happened to the Omniverse Machinima app. So I can answer this because I use NVIDIA Omniverse for Edge to the Empire. Um, so NVIDIA Omniverse is a complete set of various pieces of software uh, in, which included the Machinima app. And so what happened is you got Machinima and you've got Create and there was a couple of others. The there's not much there was not much difference between Create and Machinima. To the point I was starting to think, what's the point of developing two apps that do almost the same thing? There was there's small differences in features like um Create was the one that got the priority uh, new features, and then they, they would get put into Machinima a little bit later. And there were some things that Machinima could do that Create couldn't. 
which is more like um, to create was more for if if you want to put something together you, and you can render animated scenes in it uh, but if you just wanted to, to bring in some props and you know decorate them you'd want to use create and then machinima if you wanted to do a lot more animation yourself within that the software machinima is probably the better one to use but there was such so much overlap between that and i think at some point uh because I, I can't remember exactly when the, the switch over happened I, I just it just did and then i carried on using it they merged all these apps into one which is now called composer <laughs> right and it makes a lot of sense because why are they developing two apps that do almost the same thing uh when they could just do it with one app and then incorporate some of these other features as well that some of the other apps did um so it's not a bad thing that it's gone apart from maybe the name has disappeared which it was nice to have a, a an app called machinima but as far as actual usability goes it uh, and you know keeping the, the the software updated and it is still composer is being updated quite regularly um there was an update um a couple of weeks ago which i haven't actually tried yet because i keep using the previous one um but you know it, it hasn't disappeared it's just been merged into one app and i think that's the right thing to do uh as far as development goes and as far as keeping everything um together because you know switching between apps unnecessarily um i actually rarely used the machinima app itself i did everything in create because right. create could do everything in um because i'm also using icon to do all the really advanced animation like moving the characters around i didn't need to worry about that as far as machinima went because i'd already done it with icon um so you can still do that you can uh animate your scene in icon you can export it over to omniverse um and it, it just loads up instantly in um composer so you know it's not a bad thing it's gone okay well so here's the thing i just want to say then thank you very much to nvidia because what they have done with the development of that tool using machinima as a name was help us take back what machinima was all about uh, mm -hmm. in the beginning so you know the fact that it, it it's kind of disappeared doesn't mean for me that it, it it's been a, a a pointless exercise at all i think what they've done has been hugely important um to the machinima world and i and i think um i think we probably all reflect on that as as being um a worthwhile exercise uh and um i'm i'm very grateful to them for having done it i agree yeah okay um well okay so what i then wanted to talk about given that machinima is you know i i think what amazes me is just how many films we're seeing of of, of so many different um varieties come through to us each and every month it's just it's really tricky to kind of um, make our selections and and think about why we're making the selections uh, and what we're trying to illustrate by making those selections. So I wanted to just highlight some of the ones that didn't quite make the cut for our full discussions, um, but are nonetheless some really cool machinimas that we've seen and not necessarily always machinima, um, but some, some just fascinating projects. So, Projects that I want to sort of um, flag are uh, one called Endgame, um, which is an upcoming James Bond inspired short. Um, there's an absolutely superb soundtrack, which includes music by uh, Dark Machine Studios, whom we've also reviewed in the past. Um, the aesthetic for the video is absolutely awesome. Um, and I, I think that's something I can recall that we discussed in the last video that we looked at for Dark Machine Studios too, you remember the one that um, he used AI for with the with the yellow, um, the yellow filter. Do you remember that? Mark uh, Johnson, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, re really cool. Well, this one's um, a more James Bondy type psychedelic -y sort of thing. Really interesting. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the whole film when it kind of comes out. And then another artist that we've reviewed um, before is actually J.P. Ferre, um, and he's released a film called DCS Spitfire Cinematic. Um, this is a really powerful film, actually. It's used um, a, an AI-generated um, voice uh, which presents the imaginary thoughts um, about the recollections of a Spitfire pilot 
um, from the war. It's really very moving. And actually, I think it's especially moving because I don't know if you've seen this on the news over in the US, but just a couple of weeks ago here in the UK, the the Battle of Britain Memorial flight um, was grounded because one of the Spitfires crashed and it killed the pilot. Um, uh, And uh, that that all took place near to where the the thing was, was based, which was incredibly sad. But but this film is really moving with what it what it's portraying. So definitely take a look at that. I think he's done a sterling job with with the with using AI as well. Then Pink Floyd has announced all of its winning music videos now. The one I was especially impressed with was created by the Dave Dude of Scrappy Films, and it's been done in Blender. Um, and, and it's been done for the single Time, which was from the Dark Side of the Moon. Um as part of their 50 years um, celebration contest. It's really beautiful work. Um, it's, it, 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 it's uh, yeah, it's some really interesting portrayals of time and death and whatnot in it. You, you've got to take a look at it. It's really interesting. Um, and then another one, uh, uh, Anomidae. Have I said that right? Anomidae. I think uh, so. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's posted the next episode of his Half-Life Supernatural series called Interloper. Uh-huh. Um, it's another cracking instalment. This one's Interloper 9, Something Under the Skybox. It's quite quite a length, this one, but it just deepens the mystery even more. He's flying with this series. Um, it's, it's really worth watching. Um, and then, Phil, you'll be really interested in this. I found two Fallout-inspired works. Um, interestingly, I mean, I, I guess this is partly the aesthetic of the game as well. But both of these films, I think, are taking what I would call a sort of Tom Jantle animation approach um, to, the, to the way that they're presenting the material. Um, so it really seems to have captured the imagination of, of, the, of the creators, although they are completely different types of creator. One of them is JT Music, um, and he's done a. They've done a rap called "All In with the Fallout." Now, obviously, it's taking footage from the game Fallout Four, and quite interestingly, when I was looking at it, I noticed that Harry One Hundred and One UK did the video for it. Now, if you recall, a couple of weeks back, we reviewed Harry's Portal film, "The Sound of uh, Science," <laughs> which was right. brilliant. Um, so I didn't realize Harry was doing the videos for JT Music, which I think is really cool. Um, And then the other one is called Fallout Dream On, uh, a tribute by Couch Patrol. Two completely different films, but the way they've done them is quite similar, really quite interesting. So take a look at those. We'll put the links on the the show notes. And then one final project that I wanted to highlight, uh, and which leads me nicely into the next part of what I wanted to talk about, is... um, one that's using generative AI. Now, this one is an animation of Anthony Hopkins, and it's called Fables of the Foolish, and it's by Drico. Uh, It's just delightful and so very witty. It's an animated character of Hopkins retelling what Drico refers to as the fatefully foolish exploits of idiotic protagonists who meet their untimely ironic demise thanks to their own oblivious actions. In other words, <laughs> known as the Darwin Awards. <laughs> right. It's a sublime comedic parody. It's brilliant. You've got to just see it. Um, it really sounds like Hopkins. I'm guessing he's used 11 labs or something like that. To... Yeah, I, I'll bet it's an 11 labs voice yeah. profile. Yeah, it's, it, it's absolutely brilliant. It is spot on. It's, it, yeah, I really loved it. Um, I guess that might be a, a point at which we can ask the Ricky AI what he thought about it. Yeah, Ricky, what do you think about this uh, uh, this Anthony Hopkins film uh, and the, the one about the Darwin's Awards? Salvation Army is a great place to go to get fish. A lot of people don't know that. Uh you know what I think? You know what I think AI Ricky is doing here is very clever. Is he's kind of uh, I, I don't I don't know what he's doing there. Um, <laughs> yeah, we might have to think about that one a little bit. Ricky Ricky has always been a fan of the theater of the absurd, so maybe uh, 
is is that what you're trying to tell us, Ricky? Or are you are you making some kind of a absurdist commentary on on this? Slowly, the cat came up the, the, the road and told me that Sally is going to be late for school. Now, why a cat would do that? No, 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 no idea. No, okay. I think I think no. I yeah. don't know what he's talking about there. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank thank you thank you, Ricky, for that. Brilliant. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, let's. Okay, all right. So, AI is genius, isn't it? <laughs> My AI updates then. Firstly, Eleven Labs has released a dubbing tool set tutorial, which actually makes, I think, well, it makes it quite helpful for um, doing different languages um, uh, and different language videos even more accessible. Can't wait to see what you all do with that, actually. Then uh, Google DeepMind has announced a new video generation model called Vio, which produces um, pretty high-res videos, actually, for over a minute in length um, and using a whole range of different video styles. So that looks quite interesting. Um, Stability AI has launched Stable Artisan to a wider user group on Discord. Um, it's a tool for media generation and editing, so it's not probably quite our audience, but it looks pretty interesting um, for, you know, maybe creating promotionals and what have you. Um, and then the one that really did interest me is a, is a TV show generator, which, which has been launched called Showrunner. Uh, now that's been created by a studio called The Simulation, and it's basically a text to episode generator. Now, these are the same guys that released that um, weird South Park AI episode last year. So um, I can't wait to see what folks do do with this. There's already a few shows up on their channel, if that's what you want to call it. Although some, in fact, are referring it for referring to it as the Netflix of AI. Um, now, there's a wait list operating to get early access to it. And I'll put the, the link on the show notes. But it looks quite intriguing, I think. Then the winners of the second AI Film Festival were announced during the month by Runway, uh, the last month. Um, the best film is called Get Me Out, and it's um, being done by Daniel and Tebby. It's an, it really is a beautiful film. It's it's actually done with a with a realistic central character, but it's an incredibly moving and and powerful story. It's definitely worth. Uh, watching it's been it's, it's told in Japanese actually as well which is which somehow seems to make it even more compelling so mm. definitely have a look at that and then finally on the on the AI side of things um on LinkedIn uh day job so to speak it's not on YouTube at all um but this post that I saw by a guy called Luke Shuja um which I'll put a link to, it includes a video parody of Sam Altman talking to an interviewer, I'm guessing Luke, about how to make it big and also how to generate an audience using social media. And it's it's been made using Sigma GPT. Um, but what's such fun about it is the creator has used Altman's head sticking out of a toilet uh, which he's created using replicant, and he's called it Skibbity Sam. Um, and it's re it really is comedy gold. I have to say, it just absolutely it is hilarious. Yeah, you you definitely should should have a look at it. Um, I, I'm hoping that a link to a LinkedIn post takes you there, whether or not you're on LinkedIn. Um, so I'll put that on the show notes as well. And that's it. That's all my news for this month. I don't know what you guys have got, Ricky. Uh, what do, what do you think about if we uh, if we modify your generated AI version to be Skibbity Ricky? Is that something that uh, that you'd be interested in? I wonder how much longer it's going to take the sun to explode. Don't you think it's been a long time now? It's it's, it's overdue. Um, oh. Okay, this is. Uh, this is not going how I expected, but uh, thank, you, thank you, thank you, Ricky. That's 
That's great. Maybe he just didn't like the skibbity Ricky thing. Uh, it it could be. Yeah. Did he sound angry? I, it's it's really kind of hard to read. Um, yeah. Damien, what news have you got? Um, I got a few pieces of news. Uh, I'll start with the AI one since we just had some AI news. Um, this is from uh, Sony Music, so it's not necessarily about Machinima itself, but they have opted out of AI training uh, for all of their entire music catalog. So they've gone to all the AI training uh, companies and said, please do not use our music to train your AI because we, we're not interested. Now, I posted this in our little group chat that we have for some news, and I saw yesterday that I have no chance to post it in because I only saw it yesterday. Um, Sony uh, have also taken the unusual step of this is doing the complete opposite direction of using AI in the upcoming TV shows and movies, but not their music. Oh. I, I, I didn't have a chance to read all, too much into that, but I imagine that they're going to somehow use AI in their future uh, visual productions, uh, but they don't want their music as part of it. And uh, I guess we'll we'll have to wait and see what's going to happen there. Um, some may say that the quality of their recent Spider-Verse uh, may be improved by AI. <laughs> which <we've... laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, given some of our recent experiences with poor AI superhero films, um, that says a lot. All right, so moving on to uh, some more uh, interesting, uh, more machine-related uh, subjects. Uh, we talked about the back rooms last year um the the origin the start of the whole thing has been discovered by some uh, internet sleuths and it was a uh, picture that no one knew where it came from of the the you know, rooms with the yellow floor and the right. walls and there's no yeah windows. yeah remember it right uh it turns out that was from a hobby shop that was com had been emptied out because it's in the process of being refurbished <laughs> Uh, and that was taken <laughs> back in 2007, I believe it was. I posted it online. Uh, and then the the people who own and run this hobby shop, it still exists, still runs now. They had no idea that a decade or so later, someone would find that picture and make this whole backroom thing. They had no idea about any of it until these detectives tracked them down and contacted them. And I, I think they weren't quite sure how to react to that, but I think they're quite pleased. Uh, and then they've actually gone and posted some pictures of what the shop looks like now. Oh, um, no, that's ruined it. Yeah. I mean, they've got windows <laughs> now. It's all brightly lit. And, the, the, you know, they've got things. Mm. There's a, <clears throat> a huge sort of remote control car um, track that people can take their models on and race on. And it looks very different from what we've seen in the back rooms. Um, I, I thought, would I have thought wanted... Disney would be up for doing a theme park with the back rooms. <laughs> Don't you think? That would be very creepy, but yeah, I can see that. Creepy but and yeah, very, is... very, very low budget. Yes. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> anyway, since we talked about the back rooms before, I thought I'll add that to, to it because it kind of passed off the story of where it originally came from. Hmm. Well, that's a nice wrap. Thank you. Yeah. And um, last bit of news I've got. Uh, last month, we talked about um, a spiritual successor to the movies called Blockbuster Inc., which at the time of recording is a few days from release. By the time this goes out, it will be available on Steam. Um, obviously, we haven't had a chance to, to look at it yet because we're not there yet. Um, but there is a playable demo of that you should try out. But I found out that later this month, so after you see this, there's another spiritual successor to the movies being released uh, called Movies Tycoon. Um, and there was a demo of this as well, which I have not had a chance to try out. I had a look at it and it looks uh, very similar to the movies. There's even a, there's a picture I saw of the, the main menu and there's a option for just movie making. So I imagine yeah. this is going to be like the, the free from free mode in the movies where you just have everything and unlimited money so you, you still build your studio and you can recruit the actors and do all that kind of stuff but there's no restrictions and you can just do whatever you like as far as movie making goes um so I, this is a month for the movies spiritual successes yeah. uh so i'm quite intrigued to see what happens with both of these games 
because I did enjoy the movies. I know it had some limitations of what you could do with it as far as movie making goes. Um, technology has obviously moved on a, long, a, a lot since then. So I'm interested to see what these two games are going to do as far as uh, making things uh, more accessible. I know that Blockbuster Inc. has uh, built-in modding capability that they really want people to bring in their own content and you know, like costumes and sets and animations. I, I don't know how that's going to work because obviously we haven't seen it yet, but um, I'm hoping the movie uh, Tycoon will be something similar where it's very easy to bring in custom content and it allows a lot more flexibility with uh, movie making than the movies had because uh, these are going to these have the potential to be too new easy to use machinima tools so uh i look forward to seeing what people do with them and the yeah. games themselves yeah, yeah, yeah it's interesting isn't it because on the one hand you got ai which means you can create your own show <laughs> yeah showrunner or you can make it up in a game <laughs> yeah well which would you do i just the game because then you get more control over it and you, you can get the result you want yeah well, that that showrunner thing uh did did you guys watch the most recent uh season of black mirror no no okay so there's an episode in that most recent season it's on netflix and in that episode netflix this is a netflix show but in the show netflix has uh, in this episode, has a quantum computer that is generating AI shows in real time, oh. individually tailored to the people watching. Yes. This was released about a year ago, I want to say. This is showrunner, isn't it? I mean, it, it sounds so much like that, right? Uh, now, in the in of course, in black in typical Black Mirror fashion, it gets really creepy. And actually, they do a thing with it. I don't want to spoil it, but it 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 goes deeper than that. Like it's it's hard to explain, and I, there's there's no way to do so without spoiling it for anyone who hasn't seen it. But um, you know, the the general premise is that this big media company, Netflix, and they actually call them Netflix and the thing. Uh, this girl is watching Netflix. Uh, her and her boyfriend are watching Netflix. And the show that, that comes on up in the, I mean, the algorithm brings up for the recommendation and they watch it is what happened to her that day huh. as a show with yeah. actors and everything. And at one point, one of the actors is Salma Hayek, uh, who, if you don't know who that is by name, you would know her if you saw her face. Uh, very well-known actress. And she is upset that Netflix used her persona and voice and everything without her permission. But And when she goes to complain about it, it turns out that she signed away those rights and didn't, didn't read the fine print kind of thing. I mean, it is... It's in when that came out, that was really before that was just prior to AI really kind of, you know, the horse breaking out of the gate. Mm. And now it's like mm. it's it's not nearly as implausible as it might have seemed then, you know? It's it's crazy that that how how prescient that was. So that's worth seeking out, even if you're not a fan of that show generally. I believe I don't I don't know what the uh episode title is. Um, but there's only there's only a handful of episodes in that season. Um, just look for the one that has Salma Hayek in it. Um it's it's hysterically funny what they do with it, but the the premise there of this, you know, AI generated uh, just the other day on a podcast that I listen to, uh, it's a, uh, a comedian does a podcast and he was talking about having dabbled with AI music, uh, you know, uh, Suno, I, yeah. I, I always mess up the names. Yeah. Suno. 
and was raving about that he could just type in, I want to hear a song from the 1950s about a car. Uh, and it will just create it and that he just loves it. And it, and he basically just said the media, the, the statement that he had said that really stuck with me uh, and that should be a little bit alarming is the median quality of an AI song in this current technology is better than the median quality of human made music that's out there right now. And yeah, that's an averages thing. Yeah. But it's one way of saying there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of garbage music out there. There's a lot of, you know, either established artists are just not making good music or and then there's also like a lot of just amateurs who, you know, maybe shouldn't be putting their music out there, you know, quite so, so boldly because it's not great. Uh, it was it was just really jarring to hear. Hear someone actually articulate that, that. I guess it has to do with what your attitude about music is. Um, if it's just about filling your ear with with a pleasant sound mixed with, I don't know, immediate gratification, then nothing's going to compete with AI in that regard. But if you're actually, you know, if your connection with music is something a little bit more deeper, or you're wanting lyrics that are meaningful or a song that's from the heart, uh, you know, it has, that's not AI's strong suit. It's it, the lyrics are they're great for comedy, I think, um, but they're not really. I don't know. There's the 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 missing soul is evident in the AI music, but in terms of can it make a cool beat and a neat sound? Yeah, yeah, it can. And I think the same is true for some of the AI video. The way it's going is that it's going to make really good looking pieces of candy but you know if you want a you know a chef prepared meal not not sure you're ever going to you know get that so it's it's i don't know it just really stuck with me as this sense of there is it, a mark there is a market for it i think yeah i, I agree there's but an I audience think it, it depends yeah. what your attitude is to the to the use of it as well because i think if yes. if you are using it as a tool in your creative process and it's uh you know a, a, a co-creating with you which you know which, which then gives you more options through which you can select stuff that you might not have been able to create yourself um or you, you not you might not have been able to get to as many options yourself on your own without it. I think that's one set of thinking with it. If it's replacing entirely what you might want to do with it, that's that's another thing entirely. But my my thoughts really are is it's a tool. You look at it as a tool. And you look at it as a tool within your creative process. And I'm not sure if I've said this on this show before, if it if it was elsewhere, but I remain of the opinion that the most effective at the end of the day, the most effective users of these AI tools, be it AI generated art or video or music, are ironically enough going to be artists. Absolutely. Because if for no other reason, artists have gone through the process of learning what the creative process is, and so they know the language of it. And this is all about language. All these models or the, the, the generative AI models, they're all about giving the 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 model the right language. Um I mean that's why they that's why the, the that's in the name, large language models. That's what they are. And so if you if you are a master, I, I've I've told my son this as as you know, he's he's in college right now and at, at university, and we've had discussions about what skills are going to be valuable? You know, hey, I'm taking this course and I don't, you know, seems like a waste. Um, and the thing that comes up continually that I, I advise him on is that probably the single most important skill other than maybe learning how to think, uh, which I hope universities still teach that, 
have questions about that sometimes, but is how to write, which, and, and frankly, there's, there's more than a few very smart people that would tell you learning how to write properly is learning how to think mm. that it's the same thing, really. Mm. It's the same, same brain activity. And I think applied to this AI stuff, that's, that's, it seems to me undeniably true that um, if you're going to adopt these as tools and navigate, the, the most important tool is language, um, is, is mastery of language. It um, is. And, and maybe and... mastery of a specific type of language, too. It's not the same mastery of language that would make you a good social worker or make you a good counselor or make you a good lawyer. But getting these tools to do what they need to do, the people who do it best are those who take the time that you, you can't just go and talk to it like you talk to your buddy and expect to get the kinds of results that the people at the top of this game are getting. They're doing that because of a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of work. It's just It just looks different than other creative work, but it's a lot of work, a lot of experimenting. Um, all on the language level to get to get out of these things what what happens so mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 interesting it is what i was going to say was that you know the because it's because it's it's uh, using um a, you know a data set you have to remember what the da the data set is that it, that it's drawing on and and a lot of it is also it, it, it's not just um, text and images that it's drawing on. It's drawing on the metadata related to the description of the images and what have you. the The hidden part and the part that people are now beginning to ask questions about is what they call the the you know the para data, the the data in relation to the process of how say um, a visual piece was was created. So there's actually different types of descriptive data that, that that can be used, but but there isn't an awful lot of paradata, data that describes the process of making something. And I think increasingly as people start to integrate these kinds of tools in the development of their work, there will there will emerge a new kind of way of thinking about how to create stuff because we're already having to think about how we make sure that we capture um the human side of the creative process using ais in order to attempt to claim copyright of what comes out of it that's right. par that's kind of a paradata type way of thinking about it but the fact that that paradata doesn't actually exist that much at the moment is a problem um and how do you how do you capture that? It's really hard to figure out how it's it, it's captured, but it needs to be captured in order to sort of understand uh, how to how to develop new ideas using all this you know all these different different types of, of information, if you like. Um, so yeah, I'm not really I think sure. I think that I think that's important, and I also think. Uh, I think a smart way for this stuff to go would be uh, that every, so if you've ever done AI generated artwork, I, I would say particularly with the Leonardo platform, when you create an image in there or generate an image in there, all, all kinds of metadata is assembled around that object that you've created. You know, what, exactly what engine was used and you know to, to all that information is documented and attached to that image for all time well the the information that needs to be added to that metadata body is attribution absolutely yes. because if they can figure out how to do granular attribution data for these generations then at least the info is there to then figure out now, what do we do about this with it, with regard to rights, uh, royalties, all that? I, I think the engines have that information. Yeah. When they generate, I don't think it's just some sea of conglomerated info, and 
I, I suspect that these engines know all the things that they're pulling from. And maybe it's just overwhelmingly large, you know, the list of things that are being pulled to generate an image. Maybe it's, you know, I most images that are com that have any complexity at all are probably not pulling from two or three specific mm -hmm. items in the training database. It's probably many, many, many more than that. But at least show your work, you know? I feel like that that could be the beginning of mm. how to solve the artist rights issues yeah. that emerge from this is yeah. at least at least document where it came from. And OK, so then that creates all this extra data that's hard to parse through. Well, what what better thing would an engine like, let's say, chat GPT be good at than parsing and making sense of and summarizing and conglomerating that data? So that any given artist can say, I want to see, you know, I, I want a report of all the places where my artwork was was used. It starts with that information. Then to figure out what, if anything, can even be done mm. monetarily there, you know, mm. that's 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 tough because I think you're, you know, it's, that's a that's a that's a problem, ironically enough, that only AI could solve. There's no human institution that could navigate through all that and come up with, I'm thinking in terms of like, you know, comparing it to like a royalty sheet that would be generated at a music publisher. Yeah. So, you know, Joe Smith has such and such songs and they've been played on radio and he's, he's a member of ASCAP. And so they're collecting all these royalties and all that kind of trickles down into a, ultimately a statement and a check he gets, right? And I think that's what maybe people that are hoping that this is monetizable in a fair and equitable way, that they're hoping that would happen. But we're talking about data that's just, it's way too big for those largely human systems, you know? Those, those mm -hmm. systems were all formed when, you know, radio disc jockeys used to write the stuff down in logs by hand and mail them in. They were doing that in the 50s and 60s. There was no computers involved. And all that's being done with that stuff today is just a little more efficient versions of the same thing. It's logs. This is different. This is where the actual piece of work is composed of a training data set that may span hundreds of other works by dozens or even hundreds of other artists for an image that may not even be commercial in nature. So... Yeah, boy, it's a, as soon as you get into that level of detail with it, it's like, uh, you know, you, you immediately start thinking, well, a, you need an AI engine that that would tackle that, something that can super efficiently go through textual data and summarize it correctly. You know, that's the key. It is. Some of the yeah. stuff with the chat GPT, it's like, it needs some guardrails, you know? There's certain things that when we ask it to do it, uh, it's it's either hallucinating or guessing, or there's evidence that it's not uh, computing as much as it is uh, trying to be a predictor, which is the whole point of generative AI, right? It's not actually, there's no intelligence there. It's just simulated intelligence. It, it, it's, it's prediction of words and stuff. So, yeah. but an AI like engine that is hardcore data processing of all that is what would need to be needed to solve that. So, yeah, th this this ball of yarn is only just beginning to unravel. <laughs> it's 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 like with all the the problems that AI art might arguably be solving in terms of expedience, in terms of how quickly you can get things done and et cetera. Boy, it creates a whole new set of problems to solve, you know? So yeah, it's an interesting time. I hate to keep defaulting back to that. Ricky, why don't you finish us off here? What's the final word on, you know, on all this AI related stuff and, and you know, how it, what do you, what do you say? What's the verdict? 
If there's a man in the house, you can damn well be sure there's a lot of condoms, too. <laughs>